There we go. So, hey, Counselor, how are you doing? Good morning, Sean. And hello, everyone out there when you're eventually watching this. <laughs> I really appreciate it. changed a little bit. This is our third time doing this now, every three weeks. A lot different the first week, halfway through, and now, I don't know, maybe we're on the we're, we're coming out a new end, I guess. That would, or it's a new you know, I'd like to think so. But again, it all depends if we keep doing uh, the good stuff that we've been doing and just, you know, especially the distancing, washing your hands, wearing the mask, um, you know, just being very careful when you go out, especially the distancing, uh, you know, please don't cough in anybody's face. More importantly, don't let anybody near you close enough to cough um, at you or sneezing, you know, um, this is allergy season. We're, sure. we're right at the peak of it. So uh, lots of sneezing in our household. So we'll get started with the, uh, the secondary plan in Waterdown. Yes. I guess in a nutshell, what is it? Is it still ongoing and has COVID made any effects on it? So great question, Sean, and thank you so much. So the secondary plan um, has been about a year now uh, that we've uh, gotten going on it. And what a secondary plan is, every community has one. Uh, and in the case of Hamilton, it's a big city. So there's secondary plans for a lot of different downtowns, neighborhoods and developments throughout the city. Waterdown has not had a secondary plan since the 1990s. And basically a secondary plan uh, determines what you can build, where you can build it, the size of the buildings, uh, what kind of businesses you want to have within that defined area. And the defined area that we're doing that secondary plan in is uh, the core of Waterdown. So it's from Parkside going south all the way to the escarpment and from just west of Hamilton Street over to just east of Mill Street. So it's a very big area. It contains lots of heritage buildings. So we've got the secondary plan going on. And it, and it is really about hearing from the residents who live in that area or are um, you know, part of the Flamborough Waterdown community, what they would like to see development wise within that boundary. So what does the secondary plan look like? And instead of having developers determine and come in and fight all the time, you know, here's what we're gonna build a 15 story building on the corner of um, you know, Griffin and Main Street or Griffin and Mill. We don't want that. So it allows uh, the residents to have a say in how the, the development planning is for their community. That's the secondary plan. Now at the same time, and as I say, we haven't had one in Waterdown since the early 1990s, so we are way past due. Um, so does it mean it I'll, could make room for like more intensification, less intensification, or really, is that what it's for? It's up for debate. Well, that's really up to the residents. So if I can give you an example, right now, um, along Dundas Street, you know, we basically have mostly two to three story buildings. If you look at the new building where uh, uh, Copper Kettle is, that's a three story building and it's lovely. It fits right in with the landscape of the old Victorian town. Uh, and, it, and it is quite a benefit to our downtown core. That's the type of development that people may want to see all along Dundas Street, as opposed to <clears throat> in that same location, there being a 17 story tower. I'm not on for that. I hope my residents aren't on for that. But it, again, everybody needs to have a say in that. And along with the secondary plan, there's two other plans being done, all of them at the same time. One is the transportation master plan, which again, we desperately need. And uh, the third one is a heritage inventory plan. So inventory of all the heritage buildings within that defined boundary and making sure that they're protected or even identifying, well, you know, this, we thought this was a heritage uh, building, but in fact it isn't. So it could be that we do a development there. Again, it's all about the residents having a say. And so that secondary plan takes anywhere from 18 to 24 months. So usually about two years by the time you get the consultation with uh, the residents. And, and I have committed to three public meetings. So we had the first public meeting in October and November. We had about 200 plus people come out. Everybody just gave such tremendous input. I was, I was very, very proud of my community. COVID affected any of it? Are the meetings delayed? So, yeah. I, yeah, I'm going to say yes and no. 
Um, how it's been affected is that uh, staff, of course, you know, uh, are still working, but in a lot of cases, they're working remotely, they're working from home. So the big piece that we were going to do this month of May was the second public meeting. And again, a big public meeting, 200 people. Well, COVID hit, so we can't do that anymore. What does public input and engagement look like in the COVID area, right? So we're in COVID now, what do we do? So I met with staff over the last three weeks and we have talked about setting up a web page specifically for the secondary plan and setting it up in a way that for a two week period in June, we could heavily promote to people where that website is, have your say, have a dedicated email address and a dedicated phone number that people could pr provide their input. So if you're not on the internet, you can still you know, have a, a phone number that we would put ads in the paper, I'll put it on my e-news. Um, so we'll make sure that the information gets out there. That is putting the timing a little bit back, not by much, but then we take all the information that we gather from people on what they think of the secondary plan with all the changes that we've incorporated from the meeting we had in October. We'll put that out there, we'll get more feedback, and then in November, we will do the same thing again. And we don't know at this point what COVID effect will be for public meetings in November. So we'll just have to wait and see. We may end up doing the very same thing, but I am absolutely committed that uh, our residents need to have a say in how the downtown core is developed. And uh, the interim control bylaw motion passed by council on May 20th. Is it gonna affect the secondary plan? So it's going to positively affect the secondary plan. The interim control bylaw that, that I um, put forward that was supported by council, what it basically does is it controls and puts a freeze on any further development applications coming in until the secondary plan is done. And so, cool. you know, sometimes when a city is doing a secondary plan, uh, developers rush in and buy up properties and get applications in for demolition and development, knowing that when the secondary plan comes into effect two years down the road, there may be some restrictions on what they build. So I did not want to wait until probably June 2021, it'll come to council. I wanted an interim control bylaw to really put a freeze on development. And I was hearing from the community that they also wanted some sort of a control put on things so that there wouldn't be runaway development. We've already got enough of that in Waterdown outside of the core area. Well, we'll skip around here. Parks, uh, Mountain View Heights Park. And then we also had some people reach out and talk about the <laughs> big pile of dirt that's on, <laughs> on Coral Street or Nisbet and <clears throat> where the water tower is. So let's Mountain yeah. View Heights yeah. and near the water tower. Are there going right. to be folks there? Yes, 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 yes. So the monstrous pile of dirt that is by the water tower off of Nesbitt, it has been a bone in contention with me for, for, for many years. But I'm going to start over in Mountain View Heights. So, you know, the, the folks in Mountain View Heights, they have been waiting so very long for a park to be developed right beside St. Thomas School. And, you know, we've been trying and trying and trying to get that park developed. Now we've reached a point where the developer has committed that this summer, and I am hoping within the next six weeks that they start that park. It's a large park. Um, and supposedly they have told me they're going to start it this summer and they're going to have it completed before the fall, which is good news because then, you know, right now the, the children aren't in school, the children are at home. And there is one big park, the Agro Park, which is in Mountain View Heights. Uh, so they desperately need another one with all of the development in that area. And, and, you know, families want to be able to go for a walk and go to a park and enjoy some of the amenities and, and just, you know, let your kids burn off their energy so that uh, we can have some peace at home, right? <laughs> what about the big pile of dirt? Is that going away? Right. So the big pile of dirt that is on Nesbitt, that, that unfortunately has been, um, it's not only an eyesore, but it has been a very contentious issue in trying to get the park established where the water tower is. So right now on Nesbitt, there is a water tower 
and uh, some of the land has been fenced in and finished. But the big pile of dirt behind it, we had to wait until the developer had uh, gone through the Ontario Municipal Board Appeals, which had started, I believe, in 2009 and work its way through the courts, work its way through the appeals, finally um, you know, reached an agreement legally between all parties. And um, part of that development also includes not only building homes back there behind the water tower, but also the bypass. And so the section of bypass is being worked on right now as we speak. Uh, part of it is finished from, I'm trying to think now, Wimberley, I believe, to Babcock is finished, uh, even, even further west than that. And so the section now from Babcock over to Centre Road, that is the developer's responsibility to build that bypass. So they are doing that right now. And there's new homes to be built in there, which they now have approval to go ahead with those. And the park will be done. When will the park be done? I am hoping it will be next summer. Okay. Um, but they've been promising me for seven years that yeah. that park will be built next year. And, you know, the residents, they've been, um, they've been patient. They have every right to be angry uh, and frustrated because they've been told uh, by the developer since they bought their home, some of them eight years ago, mm -hmm. yeah. that there would be a park there. And so their children, who were little babies when they <laughs> bought are now getting close to being teenagers. Very right? true, yes. It's unfair, it's unfair. So, but hopefully that will be the plan going forward. We'll move directions and we'll go into traffic now with a few questions from Facebook. So first up, <coughs> um, are the 40 kilometer new speed limit signs being installed, where are those? So there's been quite a few uh, posts that have been installed around town. We've been getting emails for the last, I think, five months, four or five months on what these posts are about. And so the, the 40 signs are going up. So that's uh, reducing the speed limit down to 40 kilometers. We had to wait until that was, uh, the legislation was passed by the provincial government. Now the legislation has been enacted, uh, I believe in uh, December or January. And so there's a mad rush uh, to get all these signs up across the city. You have to remember, Hamilton is a huge geographic area and everybody wants a 40 kilometer sign posted on their street. <clears throat> so they're doing so many in, in uh, each ward and then doing more and more and more. So we have a few that have gone up in uh, Ward 15, mostly in Waterdown and a um, <clears throat> couple in Carlisle and Freelton and Millgrove. And so we're going to be getting more and more of those. So you will see that increase. The signs are coming. And somebody also speaking of traffic reached out on <clears throat> Facebook, Spring Creek. Can you park on both sides on that street right now? Is it possible right. to do only one side since it is a bus route as, as well? Right, so you know, I, I know that, that it can be very frustrating uh, when people are speeding down your street. If it's cut through traffic, uh, that's absolutely you know, I, I, don't, I don't understand the mindset of people that drive down a residential street and speed. You have children, you have families, but in some cases, it's actually the people who live there. And that can be very frustrating. So, you know, different times we get complaints and people will say, why don't you just have parking on one side? Because right now there's parking on two sides and it makes it so dangerous when people speed down the street. Well, I will tell you, and our models, the traffic engineers have shown me models, when you take parking off a street, the speeding increases because there's nothing to make them slow down. We need visuals to be able to clue in. If you have a wide open paved road and you have no center line and you have no defining lines on the side and you have no cars parked, what happens? People don't see any visual barriers or cues to slow down, so they speed. Not everybody, but that's what happens. So I caution people. If you do want to change the parking on your street, and we, we've done that on several uh, streets uh, throughout uh, the ward, usually it's when it's a narrow street because not all streets are the same width. Mm -hmm. So in certain areas of a survey, they may be a little bit wider, they may be a little bit narrower. If you do want to change 
the parking in your area. I can provide you with a petition, which our traffic engineers put together. It's, it's a standard form. And it, you must go door to door or recruit some volunteers within your community to go door to door and get everyone to sign, do they want the speed reduction or do they not want it? Do they want speed humps? Do they not want speed humps? So we can put a number of things into the petition, but we need to have all the signatures, yay or nay, and at least 70% must be in favor of changing the parking or putting in speed bumps or anything like that. Those are called traffic calming options, and we've done them in several areas. I'll very quickly give you um, an, an example. In uh, Hollybush, a perfect example, about five or six years ago, two residents worked with myself and with engineering staff. We came up with a petition. They went door to door. We put all kinds of traffic calming options in the petition and they had 78% of the people signed saying, yes, we want something done. We put in additional uh, stop signs. We put, uh, we did everything but speed humps because speed humps may slow traffic down, but they can also create a problem. So if you want it done, all you have to do is send an email to my office. And um, on um, traffic, ATV dirt bikes. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. You know, I was talking to the police about this a lot over the last couple of weeks. When you talk about the effects of COVID, this is unfortunately uh, one that isn't so great. We have got complaints about ATVs and uh, dirt bikes from uh, a lot from Waterdown, particularly uh, off Nesbitt area but even over in Mountain View, uh, Rock Cliff Gardens, Carlisle, it's unbelievable, the, um, the ATVs and the dirt bikes, and on the concessions. And it is really bad on the concessions because they, they use the concessions, and, and in some cases, they're going through farmer's fields. That is destruction of a crop. That costs that farmer money. And we're not just talking about a few dollars. It could be thousands of dollars in, uh, in uh, you know, uh, devastation to, to the crop. But in the um, Millgrove area, in Freelton, so right across Flamborough, we are getting uh, increased calls about ATVs and about dirt bikes. People are home more. Children aren't in school. And so, you know, they've been in the house. Uh, they want to get out. Parents maybe want them to go out. And so away they go on their dirt bikes and their ATVs. In some cases, they're racing up and down the roads within a survey to get to an area uh, that could be through the woods, it could be an open field. And we've working with our crime managers, uh, our police, and, uh, you know, and bylaw. Unfortunately, because they're motorized vehicles, only the police have the authority to do anything about it. They have to catch them in the act. Uh, it's very hard to do because if a dirt bike or ATV goes screaming down your road and goes into the woods and you call the police, it could be, you know, two hours before the police get there, depending on what the emergencies are across the city. It's, a, it's an issue that is almost out of control uh, in Upper Stony Creek, Glanbrook. It is right across the city. So not just in Flamborough, but it, it really, you know what? I mean, it worries me because we've, we've had two deaths uh, of, of, you know, someone on an ATV, um, you know, lovely, lovely girl from, from Waterdown, unfortunately, and not their fault, not their fault. They had protective equipment on, but it is a dangerous, dangerous thing to do. And sometimes even when the police go and talk to the parents, uh, you know, whose children are on these ATVs and dirt bikes, um, let's say they don't get a warm welcome. In some cases, they're told to get off my property you don't tell me how to raise my kids, um, you know, and some of them are saying, oh gosh, we had no idea. We're really sorry. Let me talk to my kids. So they get different reactions, right? And I hear comments often. We don't have enough police in our community. The police are in the community. Sometimes they're in unmarked cars. They don't have a big cherry on top of the car going all the time to say, we're here. They don't want the community to know how many people are in 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 your area because guess what there's criminals who are there as well so you don't want to tell the criminals and people who are even up for petty crimes 
that there's a lot of police in the area. So, you know, I just ask everybody to please give the police a break. They are working very, very hard for us. Uh, we do have good police presence. I see them and I, di I drive the, the ward every day, not only when I'm coming in here to City Hall, but you know, to go out and talk to residents and just to generally see what's going on in the area. I see them every single day. We might have answered this kind of with speeding and police questions, but somebody else posted like, what about speeding in the Fortinas parking lot or red light cameras on Dundas? No, so thank you, thank or you, because, <laughs> yeah, so the Fortinos Plaza, it, first of all, it's private property. Um, the police do have a letter of permission to be able to go onto the property. That was something that, you know, this has been an issue that's been ongoing for years. It had calmed down quite a bit. And then it started back up again, again with COVID. You've got people at home, they're not in school, different times of the day. Um, but it has become a particular issue, especially at night and especially behind Fortino's itself. Uh, and so, you know, I was talking to uh, their senior management at um, uh, Condor who own the, the, the plaza and they're aware of it and they have been working with the local residents. And I encourage you that if you, you know, if you have an, an issue, many people are letting us know, which is terrific because we then bring Condor into the discussion. And um, it's my understanding that they had also, Sean, hired uh, some security police to, to have a presence there in the evening. Mm -hmm. But it is a problem. As far as the red light cameras, we do have them. We have a red light camera at uh, Mill Street in Dundas. And let me tell you, <laughs> it issues a lot of tickets because people do speed through there and charge through a red light. And in many cases, they should never have been going the speed they're going. And there is no way they could have stopped safely uh, because the light was already red when they're going through it. And property taxes, people have chatted about that. Did they go up during COVID? No, they did not go up during COVID and they did not go up because of COVID. We have a budget cycle. Um, every city, every municipality has a budget cycle. The city of Hamilton's budget cycle for approvals is that we approve, we need to approve our budgets uh, in, in the middle of March at the very latest. We start working on budgets in September. Our capital budgets are usually between September uh, and finally approved sometime in December. And then we get into the operating budget and it's almost daily for January, February, and, and hopefully by the time we get to March, um, you know, we're starting to, to get the number where we want to in terms of the tax increase. This year was particularly difficult. We started off at 5.6%, 5.6% increase. None of us were on for that. So we worked with staff and found, I think it was around uh, $42 million in savings. And we started whittling away and trying to get that tax increase down. Now prices go up, costs go up, the cost of living goes up. And I know people are hurting right now. Uh, you know, it, it's been, it's absolutely devastating for so many people. But at the same time, it's been devastating for the city as well. We don't have any revenue coming in, which would normally offset our budgets. So the revenue that would normally come in from the rental of our arenas, uh, our fields, you know, all of these taxpayer beautiful facilities, they're sitting empty because of COVID. We're not able to collect the money. In fact, any money that was put down, we have refunded back or will be refunding back. So, you know, it, it taxes go up every year. We try and balance them. We got it down to 2.9% citywide. Um, and, you know, out in uh, the rural areas, we worked uh, really hard with staff. I was able to get uh, the tax down to 2.2%. So 2.2% is pretty good. Even Burlington was at 3.99% and our surrounding municipalities. The only municipality, and this has been for the last 10 years, the only municipality that has been lower than Hamilton has been Windsor. And it's only by, you know, 0.3% uh, or something. So Hamilton has, we worked very hard. We have good staff. Uh, we try and keep our, our costs down. We, we keep our revenues up as much as we can. 
But you know, we're talking about a 1.9 billion with a B billion dollar budget. We pay for all the police, even though they're provincially mandated. We pay for all of public health, even though they're provincially mandated. We pay for the EMS and the police and the firefighters, and they do an amazing job, and we love them all. And we're so grateful for how they keep us safe. They're all provincial, but the municipalities pay for them. And that was all downloaded onto every municipality back in the late 1990s, early 2000s. So it's a struggle every year, but I'm actually, um, I'm happy that we were able to, for Flamborough and for Waterdown, get that tax down to 2.2%. The rate of inflation and the cost of living are at about 2.2 to 2.9%. And so, you know, for councillors and, and for our finance staff, that's what we look at, is if we can be within that range of our cost of living and our rate of inflation, and we've achieved that. And I know it hurts, I know it hurts. My taxes are over $10,000 a year. It hurts me. With all of the money that's not coming into the city, I mean, does that mean like next year they're just going to go up even more? Or when people that, I guess two questions in one, what happens to people that deferred their taxes because of COVID? And are taxes going to increase next year because of all this money not coming into the city? Those are two very good questions. And I'm going to answer the first one because we did bring in, uh, we got a motion that was unanimously supported by council for a deferral of taxes. And the deferral um, is still in effect and it is going to be in effect until, Ju until July. And if you still can't pay your taxes, I encourage you to phone the finance department or get in touch with my office and we will help you navigate that uh, and, and, and just see exactly what it is that we can do to help you. Um, you know, I, I, it really bothers me when there's rumors out there that are untrue. All rumors, as far as I'm concerned, are untrue. But when they are untrue to the point of causing uh, stress in people and, and hurting people, that's not fair. So we will help you with that. And the second part of your question was on without all this money coming right. in, are the taxes going to go up even more so? And, right. and you know, I just want to say... I heard the mayor uh, a couple of months ago, I think it was, or sometime within the last few weeks of COVID, say that our taxes potentially could go up 7% next year. And I do find that a little irresponsible for anyone, I don't care who it is, in government to come out and throw a number out there that is speculation at best. There are a lot of discussions going on. Uh, the mayor himself is championing discussions with the federal government and the provincial government to help municipalities and to, to provide some sort of funding uh, because all municipalities are being affected by COVID. There is no question. And so, you know, I'm not sure what our cost is right now, but um, it's, it's up there. It's a few million dollars. So is there going to be a tax increase next year? There's always a tax increase. Are we going to work hard to try and keep it down? I will not support a tax increase that is above the 2.9%. I want to, you know, we look at uh, and evaluate the cost of living and our rate of inflation and what our budgets look like. And again, you know, 1.9 billion is a lot of money, but then again, we have a lot of expenses and a lot of people that we're responsible to pay. Um, and that's the way you have to do your budgeting. So, you know, I think it's way too early to speculate, uh, even how much money we're going to get, how much assistance are we going to get from the province and from the federal government. They are in great talks about that. I'm confident we will get something and we have to wait and see. Speaking of taxes, I guess when more businesses come to Waterdown, there's another business paying taxes, like somebody mentioned here, L3 uh, Westcam is moving to Waterdown, concerned yes. about traffic in the areas. But I get any other businesses that you know of coming to town that people might not be aware of? So I do, but I can't say anything right now. So we're in negotiations. <laughs> <laughs> That's the double-edged sword. You know, I, 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 I can't say anything until things are signed on the dotted line. Hang on just a sec. Yeah, for sure. <laughs>
Sorry about that. But I guess, yeah, business is coming to town. Obviously, there's going to be traffic issues, but then there's more people paying taxes and more businesses. And I'm sure their taxes are a little bit higher than residential. So, yes, and, and for L3, West Cam, uh, moving into the Clapeson area, they are having, they will have their own dedicated road. Uh, in fact, series of roads. It's not just one road. And, and stoplight on Dundas Street. So that will be a way of regulating the traffic. Um, the traffic there by and large is going to be heading down number six or up number six. A number of uh, employees who work at L3 do live in Waterdown. Um, uh, but you know, there's, they're, they're from all over. There's Burlington, Brantford, quite a few of them live in the Brantford area. So, uh, and in Hamilton on the 403. Um, you know, we're, we're, we worked for two years to get that deal, to get L3 to come to Flamborough. And uh, it was hard, Sean, because I couldn't say anything. So when people ask me the question, what other companies are coming? L3 is a big one for us, a very big one. And, um, you know, it's uh, over $2 million in taxes will be realized. So once the building is built and it's open, we still have to wait for MPAC to do an assessment of what the taxes would be. That takes about another uh, year and a half before that process is done. The paperwork comes into Hamilton. So they'll probably be open for a couple of years before the full taxes are realized. But uh, I'm, I'm really excited about it. We've got CHCH building new studios. We have Stryker that's now landed there. Uh, WPE equipment is almost finished their build. And so there's, there's about six or seven really good employers coming to the area, which are going to give our residents, uh, and especially our young people, give them good paying jobs. So that means Waterdown will be big enough to be a big city on its own and separate. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard that before, have you? <laughs> We've been having that discussion for 20 years, you know, and it was always my preference that we go with Burlington and I wasn't elected back then, but I was certainly involved in those meetings and those discussions. And uh, unfortunately, um, Halton and Burlington decided they didn't want us. So uh, we are where we are. We have to make it work. Anything else you want to touch on that you've heard from people or anything else you want to bring up? Um, you know what? I just want oh, Off Leash Dog Park. Oh, right. Yes. <laughs> yes. I think someone did post on Facebook. Veronica in my office brought that to my mm -hmm. attention. Um, Yes, there is uh, heavy ticketing going on right now, folks. So if you're at Court Cliff or you're at Joe Sam's or Memorial and your dog is off leash, chances are you're going to get a ticket. And it's not a fun ticket to get, let me tell you. We are building an off leash park and it will be at Joe Sam's. It will be off of the lower parking lot. There is a, a, a big area there. Um, we found some money in the budget to be able to do it this summer. I am hoping that COVID has not shut that down that um, uh, I spoke to Parks uh, a week ago and they said that we should be okay to go. Um, they'll put up the fencing, they'll put in the gravel and um, you know, we'll hopefully get it open. So there'll be a, an area for smaller dogs and an area for larger dogs, which is really important that our fur babies feel safe and that their owners feel safe as well. So that's the good news there. Um, uh, the province, as of yesterday, I believe, they've extended their closures to June the 9th, and mm -hmm. that includes outdoor playgrounds, because I did get some uh, questions about the splash pad being open, especially with, uh, you know, the heat wave that we've had this week, although cooler temps are on their way. Uh, this is going to continue to be a cycle throughout the summer. So we are hoping to have the splash pads open. There will be restrictions on, on usage. But, uh, but we are certainly looking at that. Um, is, there and cooling, the, is there any cooling centers in Waterdown for people? Oh, thank you. That was the other thing I wanted to touch on. So in, in the past, we've, um, we've had Harry Howell as a, a cooling center. But you know, one of the challenges, I wasn't entirely happy with that because you need to have a car to get there. Mm -hmm. And for elderly people, for, you know, not everyone has a vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, so we are looking at the Waterdown Library, even though it is closed because of COVID, we are looking at having the library, um, and I'm on the library board, so we are talking about this at the board level, as well as with city staff, to potentially have the library open as a cooling center. You won't be able to use it as a library, 
Uh, and I still encourage everyone to go online because the, uh, the uptick with online books has just gone through the roof. It's fantastic, actually. So, um, but I think that just about covers it, unless you can think of I think that's it. You know, we touched on a lot else. of things that people chatted about online. You brought up some other things. I think so, yeah. And hopefully, yeah. I think we're good. I want to be able to provide as much information as possible. And I know that these these videos can get long, but I, I just, uh, I hope that people find them valuable. Um, you know, I, I really, the, other, the one thing I want to say though, is I want to send out lots of kudos and huge thank yous from the bottom of my heart for uh, all the volunteers and the people in our community, uh, the greater Flamborough area and Waterdown who are supporting the food banks. The fundraisers have been phenomenal. And, and the women in the churches that are making the uh, face masks. Um, you know, I have a beautiful uh, plaid color face mask that uh, someone made for me. Uh, she's a lovely woman in her 80s and uh, made a point of giving it to me. And I wear it proudly. Um, you know, so my husband volunteers at the Waterdown Food Bank. We have friends that volunteer at the Flamborough Food Bank uh, and, and the Flamborough Women's Center. Even though it's not open, if anyone has uh, any issues that they want to talk about, especially around domestic abuse, uh, anything to do with child abuse, the Flamborough Women's Resource Center number is still, the people are there. They can take your call. They can do counseling by, by WebEx or by phone. You know, the one thing that COVID has done, unfortunately, for people who are being abused is it has put them in a confined area with their abuser. And this can be a very dangerous situation, but it's also extremely scary for those folks. Mm -hmm. So please do reach out. Um, it's a confidential service. They provide counseling and they can help you. And I think, Sean, I think that's about that's it. it. Next time, maybe we'll have to do like a lightning round, like yes, That's no, a great like, idea. Like really like, yeah. like maybe like 20 questions and like, Yes, no, working on it, possibility, next, like. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and you know, I would love to do that. Uh, I had a, a couple of council colleagues say to me the other day, you know, out of all the wards across the city, Ward 15 in Flamborough seems to be the most complex because everything that's going on there, there is so much information that goes with it because it's a complex issue. There's, there's no kind of easy issues out uh, in our area. But I feel very blessed to be uh, your counselor and uh, to be able to work on them on your behalf. And, and Sean, I just want to say thank you so much to you. My pleasure. Um, and, you know, for doing this every couple of weeks. And I for hope sure. we can keep it going for, uh, for a while. Into as the long as I have nothing else to do, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> as long as the gyms are closed and I can't go, then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, are you doing, uh, um, are you doing online uh, fitness routines? I'm working out at home. It's just nothing like working out with a group of people. Very true. I'll it's be in, true. When F45 opens up, I'll be one of the instructors there. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I've always taught group fitness on the side from doing real estate as well. So I, yeah. you know, she was just about to open. And then. Yeah. Oh, I know. I know. And you're so good at it too. To, you know, it's yeah. Very much so, looking forward to opening. Yeah. I worry. I worry about my small businesses. Um, you know, I say my small businesses. I worry about all small businesses in the community. I take it very personally um, what they're going through and wanting to help them. I talk to many of them. Um, and, you know, so please reach out to me. I, I work also very closely with uh, MP David Sweet and MPP Donna Skelly. And we are talking uh, probably every two to three weeks right now as the issues that are coming up in some cases are shared issues. In some cases, they start with my office and then, you know, we connect them to the other offices or they start in those offices and they connect them to our office. So you know, if, if, you, if you have issues or you need answers to questions, reach out to all three of us because we can help you. 